So just to, just to roll straight into it now, I think. Uh, so this is what I was talking about last time, introduce you to um, our pink Parkin pathway, how it is related to Parkinson's disease, um, and how the, the field seems to be obsessed by uh, mitophagy, um, but how our recent evidence might cause us to rethink exactly what this quality control mechanism is. What I want to um, talk about in this um, next session is to go back to our um, sort of st starting point, if you like, about mitochondrial dynamics. And I alluded to this uh, before thinking about mitochondrial interorganelle dynamics. <clears throat> and what we're coming to is, excuse the typo, uh, is thinking about mitochondrial calcium. And it's known that this is an important regulator of metabolism and other things, cellular signaling and so on. Um, and what we're doing on this is, is to make an investigation of, specifically of mitochondrial calcium in, in normal biology, and to bring it back to, to neurodegeneration, how this is, is uh, affecting and being affected in models of neurodegeneration. I also want to just start off uh, by saying this is this sort of been a, um, a fascination for a while, and anyone who knows anything about mitochondria has been to any mitochondria talks, has studied it, um, knows that um, mitochondria and calcium have an intimate relationship, and it's been studied really intensively um, for about the last 40 years. And I resisted getting into this field for 10 years because I know that it's really, it's extremely challenging to get into, it's challenging to manipulate, and it's rather dogmatic. Nevertheless, this is where we've ended up. So I'm sort of uh, finding my way, and I think we're going to get into some um, challenges uh, from the field. So I showed you this before. Uh, just to reiterate, mitochondria are extremely dynamic. We talked about this fission and fusion dynamics. I alluded to the fact that we've been interested in axonal transport type dynamics. Then I mentioned this, and this is what really is going to be the sort of focus of, of the next part, is this interorganelle dynamics. So what this video here is, is in red, uh, uh, a fluorescently labeled mitochondria <coughs> network, and green fluorescently labeled ER network. And this is taken from uh, this lovely science paper of a few years ago, <clears throat> so from Gia Voltslav, which uh, were the first ones to define, so it, it had been known for a long time that, and, and seen that mitochondria and ER, as well as other organelles, can come into close, close apposition, they can contact. We know quite a bit about what, what the purpose of that was. Uh, but Gia's lab were interested in sort of mitochondrial dynamics, fission fusion dynamics, and they found that at a, when mitochondria undergo scission, like here, there seems to be uh, an apposition of, of the ER membrane. So ER comes along, touches, and that defines where there's fragmentation. So that's, that's been uh, a, a, an aspect of this interorganelle dynamics, um, but it's not particularly the, the focus of the, uh, the talk, at least not affecting mitochondrial dynamics. <clears throat> but I want to just come reiterate this, this slide, that we'd previously seen that the Pink and Parkin are um, doing something to maintain mitochondrial homeostasis, and one of the actions is to ubiquitinate mitofusin, so uh, an outer surface protein that drives the fusion of mitochondria. And the final point here is that in the Pink Parkin mutants, mitofusin is overabundant. So what about mitofusin? <coughs> really, I've been talking about uh, this feature. So here you can see mitofusin. Uh, in mammals, there are two homologs, mitofusin 1 and 2. Uh, they look very similar. Um, they appear to do slightly different uh, and, and, but overlapping functions. <coughs> They're found on the outer surface. And the binding of these, they, they, they have these large GTPase domains. They bind heterotypically, and then uh, GTPase activity forces the, the fusion of the membranes. That's fine. Uh, it's also been found, uh, 
first proposed by Lucas Ferrano um, uh, and colleagues that, that mitofusin is also a component of this um, mitochondria ER uh, contact sites. Okay? So they described how mitofusin 2 specifically is also found on ER membranes and mitofusin 1 and 2 on mitochondria can then make this connection. So this, <clears throat> whilst we were thinking about dysregulation of this aspect, this also came into the picture and we couldn't really ignore it. So that's why we got into thinking about uh, um, uh, certainly how ER might direct uh, scission events affecting fission fusion. Uh, but there's another tremendously important um, aspect of how these, uh, these organelles, why these organelles are, are coming into close contact. And that is because the ER um, is the cell's major sink for calcium. And you should know, of course, that, that calcium is a, is a tremendously important second messenger, uh, relaying information from outside of cells through the cell, triggering signaling uh, mechanisms uh, at multiple places, and the ER is a major sink for, for where calcium is stored. So, the close acquisition of the ER membrane to mitochondria allows for the transfer of calcium from the ER to mitochondria. So why would this be necessary? Well, again, it's been known for a, for a long time that several enzymes in the um, uh, Krebs cycle, the tricarboxylic acid cycle, um, are calcium responsive. And of course, I think you should uh, of course, know that um, the TCA cycle is um, uh, integral to energy production and, and general metabolism. So, um, so these enzymes being calcium responsive, it's uh, no stretch of the understanding to, to realize that, that calcium can have a, uh, an influence on the rate of metabolism. And this has been known for um, 30 plus years, getting on for 40 years. It's also, it's also been well known that too much calcium is a bad thing. It's, it's catastrophic. Okay? So too much calcium getting into mitochondria, whilst you need, you can, it can provide a little bit of a boost when uh, extra energy is needed. If you have too much, this triggers what's known as the mitochondrial permeability transition by activating, uh, this is part of the reason that I resisted getting into this, part of, uh, it activates this very nebulous uh, mitochondrial permeability transition pore. There's no clear agreement on what it is, um, uh, what it's composed of, but the upshot is that excess calcium triggers this pore to open, and then that allows the sort of floodgates to open of pro machinery and then again, it's all over for that cell. Okay. So the balance of uh, having calcium enter for positive reasons and keeping it sufficiently low um, is, is, is very important for lots of reasons. <clears throat> so uh, you can see here there's this uh, channel allowing calcium in, and that's the subject of the next slide here. Um, and for those who don't know, this has been a, a bit of a revolution uh, in being able to understand and, and uh, investigate mitochondrial calcium that started in 2010, 11, with the ident the, finally the identification of the first components of this channel. So part of this uh, work has really been, been led by uh, Rosario Rizzuto's lab in Padua and by Vamsi Muthu's group in, in Boston. And uh, to, to summarize a lot of discovery and a lot of uh, basic information, uh, we, we've come to understand uh, what this pore, this channel, looks like. And it's, it's sort of collectively referred to as the mitochondrial calcium uniporter complex, or MCU complex, um, because it's extremely high affinity uh, channel that allows just calcium through um, when it becomes stimulated. And so the, the channel looks like this, that there's um, 
this MCU com component, which is the main pore forming uh, protein. Uh, there's a small protein called, referred to as emery, which is a, a scaffold protein and, and helps the, the pore to form. And then there are these gatekeeper or sort of capping proteins, um, collectively referred to as MICU1, MICU2, and there's also a MICU3. Okay. So uh, for orientation, this is in the, the inner mitochondrial membrane. Um, this is in the intermembrane space, and this is the matrix here. So calcium comes in from the outside, is sensed here, and flows through as in this diagram. <clears throat> so that's a um, flurry of activity um, allowed these components to be discovered. Of course, the, the main emphasis for discovery has been on uh, the mammalian systems, um, and we wanted to decided to manipulate this system in flights. Okay? So just to briefly uh, give an overview that, um, again, happily, many, most of these components are also conserved in flies. This is a tremendously uh, conserved um, channel. Um, it's not found in yeast. That was a phenomenon that led to the discovery of, of being able to define these things. But, uh, you know, really all metazoans have some, some component of this. So what you'll notice here, <clears throat> I'm not going to talk about MICU B, but it's sort of a paralogue of MICU, uh, sorry, MCU, these, they've got to change the names. This is terrible. MCUB is a paralog of uh, MCU, but seems to work, um, is, is less active than MCU, and s in that way is sort of is a negative regulator of the channel. Um, similarly, MICU2 seems to be a less active form than MICU1. So this the, sort of the, the belt and braces approach that allows a bit of a titration of how active this channel is. So flies do not have an MCUB, they don't have a, a MICU2. They do have the, the main components, MCU, Emery, MICU1, and they also have a, a, a homologue of this MICU3. So MICU3, hardly anything is known about it yet. You, pub, you PubMed search it, and there's, I think, one description just saying there is one, and we don't really know much about it. Interestingly, it seems to be restricted to neuronal tissues in, in mammalian systems, and that seems to be the case in flies as well. So for our interests in neuronal systems and neurodegeneration, we think this might be an interesting thing to follow up. So um, this is going to be a fairly simple uh, and a descriptive story. None of this is published uh, yet. Uh, so I'll just sort of lead you through this, um, just to give you a an indication of what we're seeing and uh, the questions and conundrums that it's raising. So we've been working on this for perhaps a, about four or so years. Um, and the first things to do, of course, were to um, um, take a reverse genetic approach. We've, we'd identified the genes. That's easy enough. Um, and then to engineer mutations in this. So. It's, it feels extremely old school now uh, when the days of CRISPR, but this was available, a P element sitting at the 5' prime of, of the MCU gene, so we wanted to target this one first, being the main pore forming component, and we used imprecise excision to define a nice small deletion and so on. Um, so we spent some time, you'll see why in a moment, worrying whether this was a, a, a proper mutant, and we, we made an antibody, and we're pretty happy that this is a, um, a true null mutant. Um, again, just for full sort of uh, disclosure, um, the locus is confounded a little bit by a, a, another gene sitting in, a, in an intron going in the opposite direction, but we're, we're com confident that nothing else is, is affected in our MCU mutants other than MCU. But the proof of the pudding um, with mitochondrial calcium is doing calcium assays, and again, uh, you know, very reticent to get into all of this, it's extremely sort of uh, needs a lot of finessing. So uh, we collaborated with, with these guys in Padova, they're real experts at doing this sort of stuff. And uh, they did some calcium uptake assays um, in collaboration with us. And essentially uh, the method is like this, that you, you take your animals, you, you get homogenates, you isolate uh, mitochondrial 
uh, intact mitochondria from those homogenates, and you, you, this is a luminescence uh, assay, and you're monitoring the luminescence. You put on, first of all, you put on, oh, this is using a, a calcium uh, sensitive dye, um, and this is uh, uh, an extra mitochondrial calcium uh, dye. So if you add in a bolus of calcium, you see the fluorescence shoot up, and then you see it gradually die away as the mitochondria take up uh, the extra mitochondrial calcium. Okay? So this is, the acid, this is the measurement of calcium uptake by the mitochondria. And then, of course, you can depolarize the mitochondria and you see it all leak out again. So that's what you'd expect in normal. Now, one of the, before the genetic approaches, before the components were known, the main, uh, one of the major tools for studying mitochondrial calcium was this um, uh, chemical ruthenium red and other uh, derivatives. And we were able to see, as has been shown previously many, many times, that adding this chemical completely blocks this uh, calcium uptake. So the system works, that's great. But what we wanted to use it for was to define our mutant. And happily, we see a complete loss of mitochondrial calcium uptake in our MCU mutant. So, perfect. Even better, we can transgenically rescue this, and we, we even get a little bit of excess calcium uptake um, that we can, we can uh, quantify here. So, uh, and just for the aficionados, this is all done, uh, these assays are all done in the uh, context of fully polarized mitochondria. Um, really just a, a technical so that's great, we've got these mutants, they lack calcium uptake, so what are the profound effects on, on biology that we're going to learn? What do these mutants actually look like? Well, so, a little rundown of what the mutants look like. So then the knockouts are viable, and they're phenotypically pretty normal. Here's a little bit of the data. They eclose at exactly expected Mendelian ratios. This is about the most dramatic thing that we can find looking at lifespan uh, versus the controls. They do have a significantly uh, shortened lifespan, but nothing else seems to be changed. Here's our back to our climbing assay over age. Really nothing is, is affected. Flight assay is not affected. So this was, this is really quite a surprise. We'd had 40 years of, of sort of in, in vitro uh, study saying that mitochondrial calcium is, is tremendously important for metabolism and general biology. So, you know, we were seeing these in an animal, we couldn't really explain it. So we, we wanted to, to, to delve in a bit deeper at the mitochondrial functional level. And so, sure enough, we were actually, uh, so these assays are looking at oxygen consumption rate. So again, just taking homogenates, fully polarized mitochondria, and seeing how the mitochondria function at their most basic level, that is, consuming oxygen to make energy. <clears throat> and you can feed in different uh, metabolites to measure uh, the activity primarily through complex one, complex two, and so on. Uh, and we saw that there's a, um, a decrease in mitochondrial activity overall across the board. And again, we sort of, we wanted to look at what the downstream outcome of this was. The outcome, the, the main go-to uh, um, function of mitochondria to pro provide energy in the form of ATP, this is barely even touched. So we can see these mitochondrial defects, but ATP seems to be managed fine. That's probably not so surprising since, again, you know, coming back to the same sorts of themes, uh, these flies are kept in totally idealized conditions. They're really not doing much. They're resting. Um, they're not putting a great demand on their metabolism and ATP. But nevertheless, it's a phenomenon of, of the model system that we're looking at. Um, extending this a little bit, and I can be a bit briefer here, uh, we wanted to look at the mitochondria, going back to our uh, flight muscle in the MCU mutants. They look pretty much normal uh, compared to controls. We've done some more sensitive assays where we can pick up subtleties in, in how the mitochondria are being handled and homeostasis, looking at our axonal transport. No difference there. Then I thought we'd, we'd really sort of come across something when we saw this, uh, um, this study, which was linking uh, mitochondrial calcium to oxidative signaling, and in this context, um, sort of a burst of uh, superoxide 
in the context of response to wound. Okay, so this, this seemed like a logical place that you could not find an effect where maybe you uh, were expecting to see one in these idealized uh, sterile conditions that we keep the, the flies in. <clears throat> However, going back to a former colleague of mine at Sheffield, uh, who's a real expert in doing this wound healing studies in flies, they've got this beautifully worked out where you laser ablate past the epidermis and then you see the wound sort of shrinking. Measuring this, no difference. So we've, we've got these MCU mutants that completely lack this fast calcium uptake and they're viable, very little wrong with them. So where we're kind of going with this, and this is going to be the story for you know, the lab for a little while yet, is to address why these animals are quite so fine. Surely there must be some kind of compensatory mechanism. Certainly, we know that calcium is getting in. So far, the field has only talked about MCU as a way to get calcium in, but there's a, there must be another way. No one particularly has an inkling uh, about how that is, but we're, I think we're confident we're going to be able to discover some of this in the fly models. Just to give you a brief run-through of some of the other components, just to show that it's not all the same sort of story, we mutated uh, Emery, now again sort of uh, using the, the more up-to-date CRISPR mutant mutagenesis methods. Um, we made truncation mutants and so on, isolated them. And these again are viable. Perhaps not so surprising if uh, Emery is really sort of just making this, this pore, helping to make this pore, and loss of the main pore forming uh, components is viable. Again, we have a complete lack of, of calcium uptake, uh, quantified here, and really no other great effects. Here's a climbing assays. There's very little wrong with these guys as well. Okay. Now, there's a distinct contrast where we started looking at MICU1. So here's MICU1, has some neighboring genes. You one might wonder why I'm sort of showing this map a little bit skewed like this. Well, that was because, again, we took an old school method, uh, P-element mobilization, and this was less successful because the one thing that we isolated was a 10 kb uh, deletion that took out a whole chunk of this. Now, happily, there's no protein coding uh, genes here. Uh, we're still in the process of validating uh, this mutant, but we're pretty confident that the phenotypes that we see are down to MCU. And the phenotypes are this. In total contrast to the others, this thing is now completely lethal. And it seems to be lethal at about the sort of larval uh, pupil transition. Okay. Now, this was to an extent, it was, it was anticipated. If you remember back to the figure, MICU1 is the, the gatekeeper, the cap of the, the pore. Um, and so if you don't have that, you're likely to get unregulated calcium entry. And so you're going to have calcium overload and triggering this MPTP uh, pore opening and cell death. So that's, that's quite understandable. We're in the process of sort of dissecting um, that a little bit further. Um, so, thinking about our genetic approach, there was a clear thing that we could, um, uh, oh, sorry, before I, before I get into this next part, um, just to impress upon you that um, we were able to show that um, even though the, the mutant is lethal, we can re-express a transgene for, for Mickey one and regain viability, so that's the first step. And also, we're able to regain almost full um, vitality. So looking at our assays for, for climbing and flight ability, looking at these green bars, this is expressing MICU1 in, in all tissues, particularly interested in neuronal homeostasis, so re-expressing in, in neurons only, and we're partially able to, to rescue um, the climbing anyway. It's a bit more subtle than the flight. So, um, so, so that's good. Um, and is, is largely consistent with this uh, picture that lack of this gatekeeper is going to lead to unregulated calcium entry and calcium overload. So we've got this lethal mutant and we've got our lack of the uh, knockout for the, the channel itself. So if the lethality is caused by calcium overload as you'd expect, we can do a simple genetic combination uh, to combine these two in a double mutant, and we were anticipating that uh, this would now rescue the lethality. And so 
guess what? This lethality was not rescued. So this has left us uh, really scratching our heads as to wondering why on earth this could be. But what it's suggesting to us is that MiQ1 is not only uh, doing a job with the MCU channel, it's doing something else. Okay? There's not a simple explanation for why if you lose the channel, um, this doesn't rescue the lethality, unless it's something else other than the channel. Okay? No one else is talking about this in the context of Mickey one It's really only in this context of the channel. Um, so just to give you a little bit more of flavor of the, the genetic interaction studies that we're doing, we're turning to sort of this well-used uh, eye phenotype um, analysis. And suffice to say, uh, just briefly, that overexpression of any of the components on their own doesn't really do much to the, um, to the eye um, uh, formation or homeostasis. Not too surprising, I don't think. Um, so overexpressing of the MCU probably has plenty of the, um, uh, the pore to uh, shut it off. But when we co-expressed um, MCU and Emery, so these components together, um, this, so this caused a dramatic uh, messing up of the eye. It doesn't really matter why if you're not used to looking at this. The, the underlying biology doesn't particularly matter why, just that this is severely disrupted, as you can see. So we're likening this to having excess uh, unregulated channels, okay? causing a severe disruption in cell death. <clears throat> so does this fit with what we um, would expect with the, the biology? Uh, so what we can do is perhaps re restore um, uh, this sort of full, uh, the full channel in its, its native form. So what we've done is now make a combination which is essentially this, although just for the aficionados, we're, we're adding in another inert UAS. When you're doing a lot of these sorts of studies, this is GMR, GAL4, and you're loading in a lot of UAS transgenes, you need to be concerned about titration effects. So just bear that in mind if you're doing these sorts of um, experiments. Now what we wanted to do, um, where we had a fairly predicted outcome, was take this um, unregulated channel from the UAS overexpression of MCU and Emery, so this thing, now titrated with a GFP, and now add on to that excess of, of MIQ1. And so sure enough, um, this blocks this phenotype. Okay, so that's, that's fairly uh, understandable. It's consistent with now having excess channel that is shut off. No big deal. But this did allow us, really for the first time, to address, well, what is the action of MIQ3? The assumption would be that it's sort of acting like MIQ1, and for some reason has a neuronally restricted pattern. And what did we see? Essentially nothing. So when we co-express MIQ3 on top of um, this condition of um, MCU and Emery, it's really non-effective in, in closing off the pore. So to, to sort of summarize this little part, to just give you a, uh, an overview, um, rather surprisingly, uh, loss of the main pore-forming components, MCU and Emery, are completely viable, really very little wrong with them. Loss of the cap is lethal. And what I didn't describe today uh, for the sake of simplicity, MCU3 mutants are also viable. So we're really uh, scratching our heads about what MCU, uh, sorry, MICU3 is doing. But um, what we found, of course, is that um, the lethality of the MICU1 may not be solely due to mitochondrial calcium. So I think there's a, there's a lot to discover right there. Excuse that, something's gone wrong. So the, the next area that we've, we're uh, tackling is to do things like transcriptomics and metabolomics, really to, to explore the biology of this uh, poor forming component. And we're also doing some genetic screens. I hope to be able to tell you a bit more about that in the, the coming years. <clears throat> now, we've been building the fly models, and of course the, the field has, has progressed very rapidly in the last few years. Um, and mouse models are, are, are coming to light. So, given what I've told you, it probably won't surprise you to hear that the first mouse model reported uh, the loss of, of MCU reported a, a viable mouse with very little phenotype. OK? 
Okay. Now this was uh, uh, this was in 2013 actually, and was a bit of a, uh, a splash at the time because it was completely unexpected. Um, so our results mirror this very nicely, but I think it's unfortunate that the field has come around to, to largely discredit this study um, based on the genetic background. Now, again, using flies, I think you, one of the things you can control very exquisitely are things like genetic background. And you need to be thinking about these sorts of things in your studies if you're not um, already on board with that. But the upshot was this. This viability of this MCU knockout mouse was in this what they refer to as a mixed genetic background. So they'd made their knockout in ES cells and they started to, to homogenize the background. And in the meantime, they'd had this mixed genetic background, it was perfectly viable. By the time that they'd, they'd uh, backcrossed it onto a black six background, they had what's now referred to as sort of semi-lethal. Some groups actually claim that their, their strain is now completely lethal. But I think this is a, so, so they're, they're much happier uh, as a field with loss of MCU being really detrimental, right? Now, if you take, in my opinion, I think this is misguided. We all know that uh, in, anyone who knows anything about human genetics uh, knows that inbreeding is not a good idea, okay? And that's essentially what this is. Putting it onto a homogenized um, inbred background is going to confound the specific mutation you want with the multitude of, of changes that are inherent in this inbred um, genetic background. So I think the field is missing a trick by disregarding this as being the true uh, phenotype of the MCU knockout. Nevertheless, what this indicates is that there is um, genetic influence on, on the outcome, right? And I think there's important things to be learned there. Uh, we're also seeing in our genetic screening uh, influence of other genes on the viability of, of knockout of these. <clears throat> um, there was another uh, very interesting study that I just want to highlight here, um, really reporting on the, the knockout of MICU1, which in contrast to ours uh, is it's claimed as perinatal lethality, so some pups die uh, during, during development, uh, and some are, are born, and some of those uh, neonates will die very early on. Now, what's tucked away a little bit in this paper, so again, that was, that was very comforting to the, the mitochondria field, but it's tremendously important, obviously, for biology. What's kind of um, tucked away a little bit in this paper is that those animals that uh, survive this sort of neonate period go on to be perfectly fine. So you've got this, this sort of you know, bimodal switch. Either something has happened and it's catastrophic so that you die, or you can deal with it and it's perfectly fine. And uh, one, of the, um, one of the aspects of this study was showing that... Um, one of the things that they found was that um, those animals that go on to survive have a, lo have a lower level of emery, and so they think that the, the channel is sort of modulating itself. Okay. Um, this is really to, to just make the point that uh, they also alluded to emery knockout mice, which were uh, emerging at expected Mendelian ratios, and so it, it indicates that they're relatively normal i.e. back to this sort of situation over here. Right, so that's sort of the basic biology um, aspect, but what about neurodegeneration? I'm more sort of here to talk about neurodegeneration and think about this. Um, so uh, we've been uh, talking about this um, quite a lot this morning, and there's, there's quite a lot of history in the Parkinson's field of uh, thinking about calcium. But this is more in the sort of um, neuronal calcium signaling uh, situation. And one of the uh, reasons for this is considering the peculiar uh, neuronal subtype that, that's affected in Parkinson's, being these um, substantia nigra neurons. One of the things about these neurons is they're extremely long. Okay. Um, won't really go into that today, but I'm happy to talk to anyone who's interested in that phenomenon. 
But the, the other interesting phenomenon about these um, nigral neurons is that they have a very uh, characteristic and rather unusual pacemaking activity in as much as they're, they're constantly firing all the time in a very rhythmic pacemaking activity. And this is what uh, regulates a lot of the um, motor circuitry so that the voluntary movement um, is fired when, it's, when it needs to be fired. And again, one of the, the characteristics of these neurons is they have very unusual um, calcium channels. These are, of course, plasma membrane calcium channels. <clears throat> but again, there was uh, some evidence in the literature bringing us back to our, um, <coughs> our old favorites here, Pink One, um, noticing that um, there was an excess of mitochondrial calcium in uh, models of mutant Pink One. So, we wanted to turn our attention to this. Now that we had our models of, of uh, MCU loss of function, we combined this with our models of, of PINK1. And what I'm showing in these three bars are three different genetic manipulations for loss of MCU in combination with PINK1. And we were delighted to see that this was uh, sufficient to suppress um, a lot of the phenotypes. So here it's suppressing the climbing defect it suppressed the degeneration of dopaminergic neurons, and it's, it was suppressing the uh, disruption of the mitochondria in the flight muscle. Okay. Now, um, a little surprisingly, we looked at some mitochondrial functional assays, so we have a decrease in ATP. Um, loss of MCU didn't have any impact to suppress that, but I don't overinterpret this, but what I think this means is that ATP is certainly not particularly limiting um, and it's not a cause of these sorts of phenotypes. If you can rescue these, uh, but not ATP, that's the interpretation we get. But at least what this sort of indicates in, in terms of what's going wrong with PINK1 condition is that um, these suppressing conditions is preventing calcium overload. <clears throat> okay, so we had that nice uh, data emerging with MCU. We had these other tools, so what about some of the other uh, components? So we'd knocked out MCU, what about Emory? And again, we were happy to see a, a similar trend in the same direction, that knockout of, of Emory in combination with PINK1 was also leading to a suppression. In contrast, um, loss of function of the MICU1, the gatekeeper, wasn't providing suppression. If anything, it was starting to, to make things worse. That's largely in, in line with um, what you'd expect. <clears throat> so... Um, Again, just to come back here um, to our starting points of excess mitofusin through uh, unregulated or mutated PINK1 and PARKIN pathway, um, we think that in contrast to what this is doing to mitochondrial dynamics, um, excess mitochondrial uh, mitofusin is going to cause these excess uh, mitochondria ER contacts. And that's, of course, where the mitochondria get their, uh, get their calcium. And uh, um, uh, Miguel Martin's group in Leicester has actually uh, done an EM study to show that in the pink and parkin uh, mutant flies, fly brains, there is indeed actually um, an excess of mitochondrial ER contact sites, as you predict from this sort of uh, scenario. <clears throat> okay. um, I just skipped that for the sake of simplicity. Uh, just one final point ab about this is that if if this mechanism really is working through a transfer of calcium from ER to mitochondria, um, we can also manipulate the ER side of this, this calcium transfer. And so we've found a mutant for um, this ITPR, the inositol triphosphate receptor, that is one of the components that uh, extrudes calcium from ER. And loss of function of that, similar to MCU, prevents uh, the, the phenotypes in our pink one mutants. The flip side is that we also have um, transgenic lines that increase the tether, um, so increase the, the amount of contact between the, the mitochondria and ER, and that's having the uh, opposite effect of this by, by increasing the detriment in the pink one model. So the take home from this is that, that these manipulations are certainly consistent with an ER mitochondria calcium transfer contributing to the um, uh, pink one pathobiology. And just the final little, little part, 
Um, whilst we've been mostly interested in sort of the pink parking mechanisms, uh, calcium and mitochondrial calcium as well has been linked to multiple um, neurodegenerative disorders. So for familial Alzheimer's disease, for Huntington disease, um, and others as well. <coughs> so we've started to explore this, and this is fairly preliminary data, but uh, a model of Huntington simply expressing the, the polyglutamine repeats um, causes this uh, retinal degeneration, the loss of the rhabdomeres, and, and so loss of MCU, just like in the PINK1 model that I'm showing you, is sufficient to suppress um, this retinal degeneration and appears to be uh, extending the lifespan of these uh, Huntington flies as well. And very finally, we've, we uh, have been using, playing around a little bit with the um, A-beta 42 Arctic model of Alzheimer's disease, and we're seeing a, a beneficial effect of loss of MCU in, uh, in this condition as well. As I say, this is all quite preliminary, so we're hoping to extend this uh, in the coming months. Um, so, in summary here, so the, the MCU and Emory mutants are, are phenotypically quite normal. We're very puzzled about uh, why this is. We're exploring the, the compensatory mechanisms. Um, but the, the MICU1 mutants are, are lethal. So the questions that we're sort of uh, asking now, what, are the, what really are the true requirements for this fast calcium uh, uptake? It's clearly not that important to the animal. It can get on get by just fine. Um, we're exploring what the compensatory mechanisms for calcium getting in are. Um, but importantly, uh, what we're really interested in in terms of uh, neurodegeneration is that the loss or even partial loss of the MCU can be ameliorative in, in multiple models here. Um, so for the sake, for the context of, of the pink and Parkin uh, mutants, we think this is driven by uh, excess ER mitochondrial contacts by the excess mitofusin that we've, we've previously described. <clears throat> so this, this aspect of being able to um, inhibit MCU to be ameliorative in pink Parkin uh, uh, models of Parkinson's disease and hints with other neurodegenerative conditions like um, uh, Huntington's and Alzheimer's I think is really uh, quite exciting for us because we know that there are um, uh, we know that there are drugs that manipulate the, um, the MCU complex. Okay. Um, yeah, so that's, that's what I've just said. So I'll, I'll leave it there. I think we've, we've come a little bit back on track with time. Um, just to say that, uh, so Roberta, who's lurking at the back here, um, has been one of the driving forces of the, the MCU uh, project, along with, with Tom Gleason, a graduate student in and uh, great collaborations with um, Luca and Eleanor and Sophia at Padova to, to run this kind of calcium assays and teach us what we need to know about calcium. So that's a separate story, and I'll be happy to take any questions about this or the previous uh, story that I was telling you now, or feel free to grab me over lunch or this afternoon. Thank you very much. Okay,